to you how uh, deeply uh, moved I am. Your hospitality, speaking of hospitality, your hospitality is not only a great honor to me, it is an incomparable gift. And there is no doubt this is a, an event which I know will leave, will not leave anything untouched or unchanged uh, in my life. Despite all my expectation and anticipation, for years and years, everything is <coughs> and will remain new and uh, astonishing for me, and unpredictably decisive, I'm sure, for everything I may from now on experience, live, think, or write. And of course, <coughs> you can trust me, this is true. This is not a conventional statement, so, and it, is, it does not belong to any uh, uh, history of the lie. <laughs> so I would like to say my, my profound gratitude to all, all of you, to my hosts in this university, and to all the persons, friends, and colleagues who have made this experience possible for me. Now, before I even begin, before even a preface or an epigraph, Allow me to make a confession. It has to do with the fable and the phantasm. That is to say with the spectral. In Greek, phantasma also means specter or phantom. The fabulous and the phantasmatic have a feature in common. Stricto sensu, and in, in the classical sense of these terms, they do not pertain, pertain to either the true or the false the veracious or the mendacious. They are, the fabulous and the phantasmatic, are related, rather, to an irreducible species of simulacrum or of virtuality. To be sure, they are not truth or true statements as such, but neither are they errors or deceptions, false witnesses or perjuries. So my confession touches on the proposed title, History of the Lie, or Short History of the Lie, by a slight displacement, by slipping one word in beneath another, it seems to, this title seems to mimic the famous title of a text that some years ago very much interested me. In the Twilight of the Idols, Nietzsche gives the title History of an Error, History Geschichte eines Irrtums to a sort of narrative in six episodes that on a single page recounts in effect and no less the history of what Nietzsche calls the true world, the wahre Welt. The title of this fictive narrative announces the narration of a pure fabrication, how the true world finally becomes a fable. Wie die wahre Welt endlich zu Fabel wurde. Wurde. It is not then a fable that is going to be told, but rather the story of how a fable fabricated itself, so to speak. The teller is going to proceed as if a true story were possible on the subject of the history of this fabrication. A fabrication that produces precisely nothing other than the idea of a true world, which risks hijacking the supposed truth of the narration. How the true world finally becomes a fable. And history of an error is only a subtitle of this text. So the, this fabulous narration about a fabrication, a fabulation, about the truth as fabrication, <coughs> is a coup de théâtre. It puts on stage some characters who will remain more or less present like specters in the wing. First, Plato, who says, according to Nietzsche, I, Plato, I am the truth. Then the Christian promise in the form of a woman. Then the Kantian imperative. 
what Nietzsche calls the pale Königsbergen idea, then the positivistic Coxcrow, and finally the Zarathustrian midday. We will call all upon all these specters again, but we will call also call on another whom Nietzsche doesn't name, St. Augustine. It is true that the latter, St. Augustine, in his two great treatises on lying, De Mendatio and Contra Mendatium, is always in dialogue with St. Paul, Nietzsche's intimate acquaintance and the privileged target of his ferocity. Although the memory of this fabulous text will remain with us, the history of the lie cannot be the history of an error. Not even an error in the constitution of the truth, in the very history of the truth as such. In Nietzsche's polemical and ironic text, in the vein of this fable about fabulation, the truth, the idea of a true world, would be what he calls an error. Now, the lie, however, in principle, and in its classical determination, the lie is not the error. One can be in error or mistaken without trying to deceive, and therefore without lying. It is true, however, that lying, deceiving, and being mistaken are all three included in the category of the pseudological. In Greek, pseudos can mean lie as well as falsehood, cunning or mistake, and deception or fraud as well as poetic invention, which increases the possible misunderstanding about what is meant by misunderstanding. And it does not simplify the interpretation of a refutative dialogue as dense and sharp as Plato's Hippias Minor, sub, the subtitle of which being a peritu pseudus anatrepticos. It is also true that Nietzsche <coughs> seems to suspect Platonism and or Christianity, Kantianism and positivism, of having lied when they tried to get us to believe in a true world. The lie, to lie is not to be mistaken or make an error. One does not lie simply by saying what is false, as long as one believes in good faith, in the truth of what one believes or assent to in one's opinion. St. Augustine recalls this fact at the opening of his Demandatio, where he proposes, moreover, a distinction between belief and opinion that could still have great pertinence for us today in a new way. So to lie is to want to deceive the other, sometimes even by saying what is true. One can speak falsely without lying, but one can also what is, say what is true with the aim of deceiving someone. In other, world, in other words, we, while lying. But one does not lie if one believes what one says, even if it is false. <coughs> By declaring that, I quote St. Augustine, the person who utters a falsehood does not lie if he believes, or at least is of the opinion that what he says is true, St. Augustine seems to exclude the lie to oneself. One cannot lie to oneself. Okay. And here is a question that will stay with us from here on out. Is it possible to lie to oneself? And does every kind of self-deception, every ruse with oneself, deserve to be called a lie. It is difficult to believe that the lie has a history. Who would dare to tell the history of the lie? And who could promise to tell it as a true story? Even supposing that the lie has a history, <coughs> one would still have to be able to tell it without lying. And without giving it too quickly, too easily, to a conventionally dialectical schema whereby the history of error as history and work of the negative would be made to contribute to the process of truth, to the verification of the truth in view of absolute knowledge. If there is a history of the lie, that is, of the false witness, and if it touches on some radicality of evil, named lie or perjury, 
then <coughs> on the one hand, it cannot let itself be reappropriated by history of error or of the truth. And on the other hand, although the lie supposes, or so it seems, the deliberate invention of a fiction, nevertheless, not all fiction or fable amounts to lying. And neither does literature, for instance. So one may already imagine countless fictive histories of the lie, countless inventive discourses devoted to simulacrum, to fable, and to the production of new forms on the subject of the lie, which nevertheless would not be deceitful histories. That is, if we may rely on the most classical and dominant concept of the lie, which are not perjuries or false witnesses. <coughs> now, why invoke here a classical and dominant concept of the lie? Is there practically and theoretically a prevalent concept of the lie in our common culture? And why recall right away the features of this concept? I'm going to formalize these features in my own fashion, which I hope is true, correct, and adequate. For the thing is not so simple, and if I'm wrong, it will not be a lie unless I did it on purpose. <laughs> but it will be difficult, I will even venture to say impossible, to prove, to prove that I did it on purpose. A fact I underscore because it brings me already to one of my theses, namely, for structural reasons, it will always be impossible to prove, to prove in the strict sense that someone has lied. Even if one can prove that he or she did not tell the truth, one will never be able to prove, to prove anything against the person who says, well, I was wrong, <coughs> what I said was not true, but I did not mean to deceive. I am in good faith. Or alleging the always possible difference between the said, what is said, and the saying, and the meaning to say, the effects of language, rhetoric, and context. Someone could say, I said that, but that is not what I meant to say in good faith, in my heart of hearts. That was not my intention. There has been a misunderstanding, and you can never prove anything against such a claim. So here, then, is a definition of the traditional definition of the lie, such as I believe I must formulate it here. In its prevalent and recognized form, the lie is not a fact or a state. It is an intentional act. It is a lying. There is no lie, there is a lying. There is not the lie, but rather this saying or this meaning to say that is called lying intentionally. To lie would be to address to another, for one lies only to the other. One cannot lie to oneself unless it is to oneself as another. To address to another a statement or more than one statement, a series of statements, constative or performative, that the liar knows consciously, knows in explicit thematic current consciousness form assertions that are totally or partially false. One must insist right away on this plurality and on this complexity, even on this heterogeneity. These intentional acts are distinct to the other and other or others with the aim of deceiving them with the aim of making them believe. And here is the notion of belief. And the, this notion of belief is irreducible, even if it remains obscure. With the aim of making them believe what is said, there what the liar, for his or her part, is supposed by an explicit, com explicit commitment, by an oath or an implicit oath, or an implicit promise to tell the whole truth or, and only the truth. What matters here in the first and last place is the intention. St. Augustine also underscored this point. There is no lie, whatever one may say, without the intention, 
the desire or the explicit will to deceive, falendi cupiditas, voluntas falendi. And this intention, which defines veracity and lying in, order, in the order of saying, or the act of saying, remain independent from the truth or falsity of the content of what is said. So the lie pertains to saying and not to the and to the meaning to say, not to the said, not to the, the, the said content. He quotes St. Augustine. He who does not know what he says is false, does not lie, if he if he thinks it is true. But he does lie who tells the truth when he thinks it is false. Because persons must be judged according persons must be judged according to their deliberate intentions. Intentions. This definition, unquote, this definition appears at once obvious and complex. We will need each of its element, elements for our analysis. If I've insisted on the fact that this definition of the lie delimits a prevalent concept in our culture, it is so as to improve the chances of the hypothesis that such a concept determined by a culture, a religious or moral tradition, perhaps more than one legacy, a multiplicity of languages, and so forth, that such a concept then itself had a history. Here, however, is a first and then a second complication. If the uh, apparently most common concept of the lie, if good sense concerning the lie has a history, then it is caught up in a becoming, in a process that risks always relativizing its authority and value. <coughs> but, and here is the second complication, but we also have to distinguish between the history of the concept of the lie and a history of the lie itself. A history and a culture that affect the practice of the lie, the manners, motivations, techniques, means, and effects of the lie. Within a single culture, and there where a stable concept of the life would reign without division, the social experience, the <coughs> interpretation, the operation of lying can change. This lying can, ri can give rise to another historicity, an internal historicity of the life. Assuming that we have at our disposal in, for instance, the so-called Western culture, Jewish, Greek, Christian, Roman, Islamic, a dominant, unified, stabilized, and therefore <coughs> reliable concept of the life. It would not be enough to grant it an intrinsically theoretical historicity, namely that which, which would distinguish it from other concepts in other histories and other cultures. One would also have to examine the hypothesis of a practical, social, political, technical historicity, I insist on technical, but we'll come to the media in a moment, that would have transformed it, or even marked it, with ruptures within our tradition. It is <clears throat> to this latter hypothesis that I would like to grant some provisional privilege here. But will it ever be possible to distinguish among the following three things, namely a history, history in German, that is a science, historical science, of the concept of the lie. Second, a history, Geschichte, the content of history, the <coughs> events of the lie, made up of all the events that have happened to the lie or by way of the lie. And finally, through three, a true history that orders the narrative, his historie, historia rerum gestarum, of these lies or of the lie in general. How is one to dissociate or alternate these three tasks? We must not ever overlook these difficulties. Now, still, before getting to the epigraphs, before even beginning to begin, I must make a second confession. You would have every right <coughs> to distrust it, as you would with any confession. By reason of all sorts of limits, in particular the strictly assigned limits of time, I will not say, of course, everything uh, in this short history. 
not even the essential part of what I may think about the history of the lie. That I do not say the whole truth about the history of the lie, this will not surprise anyone. But I will not say even the whole truth of what I myself, today, am able to think or to testify to, to testify to concerning a history of the lie and the manner altogether different in which, according to me, it would be <coughs> necessary to listen to or to tell this history. So I will not say, therefore, the whole truth of what I think. My testimony will be lacunary. Am I guilty of this? Does this mean that I will lie to you? I leave this question suspended. I turn it over to you, at least until the discussion period. Now, by way of epigraph, two fragmentary quotations will now have to watch over this prolegomena. Far from being content to tell a certain history, each of these two fragments reflects in its glow a paradoxical and strange historicity. Historicity of the lie, to begin with. That politics, that politics is a privileged space of lying, is well known, as Anna Arendt recalls more than once. And I quote Anna Arendt. Lies have always been regarded as necessary and justifiable tools, not only of the politicians or the demagogues, but also of the statesman's <coughs> trade. Why is that so? And what does it mean for the nature and the dignity of the political realm on one side and the dignity of truth and truthfulness on the other, end quote. This is how our text entitled Truth and Politics begins. The first ver English version of it, of which appeared in 1967 in the New Yorker magazine and was a response to a journalistic polemic that had followed the publication of uh, text uh, articles, Eichmann in Jerusalem. As we all know, Anna Arendt, in her own way, had taken on the mission of journalist at the Eichmann trial. She then denounced numerous lies and falsifications concerning her, of which the press in particular had been guilty. And this is the context she recalls in the first note to Truth in Politics, the title of her text. She thereby points to an effect of the media, and she does it in a well-known magazine, the New, York, New, New Yorker. I underscore, without delay, the dimension of the media, the place of publication, and the magazine titles, both New York and international publication, for reasons which that will continue, I hope, to become clear. Indeed, the New York Review of Books of the period that she published some years later in 1971, lying, that's the title, Lying in Politics, Reflections on the Pentagon Papers. As for the Pentagon Papers, that is the, the secret documents that the then Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, commissioned on American policy in Vietnam from the Second World War to 1968, they themselves, these uh, Pentagon Papers, they had been published as you probably know, by another newspaper, at once a New York paper and an international paper, the New York Times. Speaking of what was, I quote, in the mind, uh, I quote Anna Arendt, in the mind of those who compiled the Pentagon Papers for the New York Times, Anna Arendt specified, I quote, <coughs> the famous credibility gap, which has been with us for six long years, has suddenly opened up into an abyss. The quicksand of lying statements of all sorts, deceptions as well as self-deceptions, uh, 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 emphasize self-deceptions, which will be one of our problems later on. Is a self-deception possible? Is it a rigorous and pertinent concept for what interests us here, that is the history of the lie? In strictest terms, does one ever lie to oneself? So I, I, I read again. The quicksand of lying statements of all sorts, deceptions as well as self-deceptions, is apt to engulf any reader who wishes to probe this material, which, unhappily, he must recognize as the infrastructure of nearly a decade of United States foreign and domestic policy, unquote. 
Now, if history, especially political history, is full of lies, as everyone knows, how could the lie itself have a history? How could the lie, which is such a common experience, whose structure is apparently so simple, whose possibility is as universal as it is timeless, <coughs> how could the lie have a history that is intrinsic, intrinsic and essential to it? Yet here is an Arendt again, once again, in Truth and Politics, who draws our attention to a mutation, a mutation in the history of the lie. This mutation would be at work in the history of both the concept and the practice of lying. It is only in our modernity that, according to Anna Arendt, the lie has attained its absolute limit and become complete and final. So essential, ascension and triumph of the lie. Whereas Oscar Wilde, for instance, had complained in days gone by of what he called, and this was the title of a famous text, the decay of lying in the arts and letters. Anna Arendt, on the contrary, diagnoses in the political arena a hyperbolic growth of the line, its passage to the extreme, in short, the absolute lie. The absolute lie. How are we to understand this? Let me quote her again S about the absolute lie. Such, such completeness, she said, such, such completeness and potential finality, which were unknown to former times, are the dangers that arise out of the modern manipulation of facts. Even in the free world, where the government has not monopolized the power to decide and tell what factually is or is not, gigantic interest organizations have generalized a kind of <coughs> raison d'etat frame of mind, such as was formerly restricted to the handling of foreign affairs and in its worst excesses to situations of clear and present danger. And national propaganda on the government level has learned more than a few tricks from business practices and Madison Avenue methods. Madison Avenue being the place where these media have their offices. Now, it would, it would be tempting, but somewhat facile to oppose like two ends of history. The negative concept of this evil the absolute lie, to the positivity of absolute knowledge, whether in the major mode, Hegel, or in or the minor mode, Fukuyama, one should also doubtless be suspicious and somewhat uneasy about this notion of the absolute lie, given what it still supposes of absolute knowledge in an element that remains that of reflexive self-consciousness. By definition, as I said a moment ago, by definition, the liar knows the truth. If not the whole truth, at least the truth of what he thinks. He knows what he means to say. He knows the, the difference between what he thinks and what he says. He knows that he is lying. And this essential link between knowing, knowledge, <coughs> self-consciousness, and lying was already professed and played with by Socrates in that other major text in our tradition on the subject of lying, in the Ipias Minor, Peri Tupsedus. If it must operate in consciousness and in its concept, then the absolute lie that, that Aaron speaks of risks being once again the other face of absolute knowledge. Elsewhere, in the same article, Two examples taken from European politics restaged lies of the modern time. The actors in this restaging are De Gaulle and Adnawa. De Gaulle claimed and almost succeeded in making people believe that, I quote, France belongs among the victors of the last war. The latter Adnawa, quote, Makes, made the people believe that the barbarism of National Socialism 
are affected only a relatively small percentage of the country. Now, these examples are framed by formulas that oppose, once again, the traditional political lie to the modern rewriting of history and insists on a new status of the image. I quote, we must now turn our attention to the relatively recent phenomenon of mass manipulation of fact and opinion, as it has become evident in the rewriting of history, in image making, and in actual government policy. The traditional political lie, political lie so prominent in the history of diplomacy and statecraft, used to concern either two secrets that, are that, that had never been made public, or intentions which anyone, any, anyhow, do not possess the same degree of reliability as accomplished facts. In contrast, she continues, in contrast, the modern political lie, the lies, deal efficiently with things that are not secrets at all, but are known to practically everybody. This is obvious, she continues, in the case of rewriting contemporary history under the eyes of those who witnessed it. But it is equally true in image making of all sorts. For an image, she says, unlike an old fashioned portrait, is supposed not to flatter reality, but to offer a full fledged substitute for it. And this substitute, because of modern techniques, because of modern techniques and the mass media, is, of course, much more in the public eye than the original ever was. Than the original ever was. Now, unquote. Now, because the image substitute no longer refers to an original, not even to a flattering representation of an original, but replaces it advantageously, thereby trading its status of representative for that of replacement, the process of the modern lie is no longer a dissimulation that comes along to veil the truth. Rather, argues Arendt, it is the destruction of reality or of the original archive. Quote, in other words, the difference between the traditional lie and the modern lie will more often than not amount to the difference between <coughs> hiding and destroying. We will have occasion to return at length to the logic of these propositions. Are the word and the concept of lie still appropriate, given precisely their conceptual history, to designate the phenomena of our <coughs> political, techno-mediatic, testimonial modernity, toward which Anna Arendt will have so early and so lucidly drawn our attention? And often because she had herself experienced it most painfully, in particular when she was a reporter during the Eichmann trial. Here now is the other epigraph. The historicity that it also names <coughs> would be that of a set, certain sacredness or sanctity. The sacro sanctity, highly kite in German, is constitutive in Kant's view, for example, as well as an in an Augustinian tradition that Kant does not explicitly claim, the sacrosanctity is constitutive of the duty or the unconditional imperative not to lie. The duty one has to tell the truth is a sacred imperative. Rainer Schumann, a colleague of mine who died a few years ago, who was teaching at the New School for Social Research, notes in Heidegger on being an acting from principle to anarchy, and in the course of a reading of Heidegger, he notes this, I quote, since the notion of the sacred belongs in the context of the original, it keeps historical connotations. The sacred is, that's the quote from Heidegger, the trace of the fugitive gods leading towards their possible return. On the other hand, all and piety since they accompany the phenomenon of the originary, direct thinking toward that event presenting, which is not at all historical. This was the other epigraph. I will now, I will now 
try to begin, and without lying, believe me, by telling a few stories in an apparently narrative mode, that of a classical historian or chronicler. I will propose a few examples on the basis of which we could try to progress in a reflexive, reflective fashion by analogy with what Kant might have said about what he called reflective <coughs> judgment. We will thus proceed from the particular to the general so as to reflect rather than determine and to reflect in view of a principle that experience cannot provide, Kant would say. If I refer already, at least by analogy, to the great and canonical Kantian distinction between determinant judgment and reflective judgment, it is for three reasons. First, this distinction between uh, uh, determinant and reflective judgment, this distinction gives rise in the critique of judgment to antinomies and to a dialectic that are doubtless not foreign to those in which we will soon find ourselves entangled. Second, Anna Arendt, once again in Truth and Politics, recalls at length the virtue <coughs> that Kant accords to the example. And she quotes, moreover, the critic of judgment. And finally and especially, if I mention Kant here, it's because Kant is also the author of a brief, dense, difficult essay written in polemical response to a French philosophe, Benjamin Constant, which constitutes, in my view, a, one of the most radical and powerful attempts in the history of the West after St. Augustine. An attempt to think, determine, reflect the lie, but also to proscribe and prohibit any lie, any lie, unconditionally. I'm ref referring to that short, short text, famous, famous yet rarely read and <coughs> not well known, which is entitled Über ein vermeintes Recht aus Menschen's Liebe zu Lügen, on a supposed right to lie because of philanthropic concerns. Anna Arendt frequently cites Kant in the article to which I have just referred and elsewhere, but she never mentions this essay, even though it is so necessary and at the same time formidable even irreducible to the profound logic of what she wants to demonstrate. Without going as far as would be necessary in the reading of this text, one may already take rigorous account of the manner in which Kant defines the lie and the imperative of veracity or veridicity. Because the contrary of the lie is neither truth nor reality, but veracity, veridicity, truth saying, meaning to say the truth. Now, the Kantian definition of the lie, or the duty of veracity, is so formal, imperative, and unconditional, that it appears to exclude any historical consideration, <coughs> any consideration of conditions or historical hypothesis. Without a casuistical concern for all the difficult and troubling cases that uh, Augustine analyzes, most often based on biblical examples, Kant seems to exclude any historical content when he defines veracity, wahrhaftigkeit, veracitas, as an absolute formal duty, absolute formal duty, I quote. Veracity in statements that cannot be avoided is the formal duty, formal pflicht, of man to everyone, however great the disadvantage that may arise therefrom from, for him or for any other, for him or for any other. Although this text is expressly juridical and not ethical, although it deals, as its title indicates, with the right to lie, Recht zu lügen, although it speaks of duty of right, Recht Pflicht, and not of ethical duty, which could appear at first more propitious for or less incompatible with a historical viewpoint, Kant seems all the same to exclude in his definition of the lie all the historicity that, by contrast, Anna Arendt introduces into the very essence, into the event and the performance of the lie. And this is because Kant's viewpoint, if it is in fact that of right, remains purely and formally juridical. It corresponds 
to the concern with the formal conditions of right, the social contract, and the pure source of right. He writes, hence a lie defined merely as an intentional untruthful declaration to another man does not require the additional condition that it must do harm to another, <coughs> as jurists require in their definition. For a lie, for a lie always harms another. If not some other human being, then it necessarily does harm to humanity in general, in as much as it vitiates the source of right. It makes the source of right useless. The rest will unbrauchbar mark. So Kant no doubt means to define the lie what is originally a priori bad in itself, in its imminence, whatever may be uh, the motivations or the consequences. But he's concerned above all with the very source of human law and of sociality in general, namely an imminent necessity to tell the truth, whatever may be the expected effects or the external and historical context. It's just analyzing language. It's just an analysis. When I address another, I'm supposed to promise the truth. Hmm? That's part of the essence of language, of addressing the other. So, uh, if the lie is not unconditionally banned, then humanity's social bond is ruined in its very principle. And this is not a language. A lie, lying is not a human language, so to speak. So in this pure imminence, there resides the sacredness or the saintliness, highly kai, of the rational commandment to tell the truth, to mean to say what is true, what I think is true. A moment ago, Rainer Schirmann was saying that sacredness was historical. In another sense, <coughs> it seemed that for Kant, and in this case, it is not, <coughs> at least not historical in the common sense. But the hypothesis remains that it is historical in another sense, as origin and condition of a history and of a human society in general. In any case, Kant writes, I quote, to be truthful, wahrhaft, that is loyal, sincere, honest, in good faith, ehrlich, to be truthful in all declarations is therefore a sacred, heiliges, a sacred and unconditional commanding law of reason, unbedingt gebittendes, a secret and unconditional commanding law of reason that admits of no expediency whatsoever. Now, I come finally to the promised examples, or, or to my chronicles. Um, soon after his election in France, when he had already announced his irrevocable decision that France would resume its nuclear tests in the Pacific, President Jacques Chirac, you recall, solemnly recognized on the anniversary of the infamous Valdiv raid, the responsibility, which is to say the culpability of the French state under the occupation, the Nazi occupation, in the deportation of tens of thousands of Jews, in the institution of laws applying only to Jews <coughs> what one called at the time le statut des Juifs, the status of Jews, and in numerous initiatives taken over and above those ordered by the Nazi occupier. <coughs> so this culpability, this active participation in what is today judged to be a crime against humanity has now been recognized irreversibly. It is now admitted that a by a state as such its admission is signed and sealed by a head of state elected by universal <laughs> suffrage. It is publicly declared in the name of the French state before the figure of, or in the face of international law in a theatrical act widely publicized, publicized throughout the world, the world by the written press by radio and television. And I, I'm underscoring once again this relation between the res publica, the, the political space, public space, and the media, because it, along with this mutation of the status of the image, is one of our themes. Now, the truth proclaimed by per President Chirac has from now on 
the status, that is, both the stability and the authority of a public, national, and international truth. Yet, this truth <coughs> concerning a certain history has itself a history. It will have been legitimated, accredited, established as such, only more than 50 years after the facts in question. Six president of the French Republic, Oriol, Coty, De Gaulle, Pompidou, Giscard d'Estaing, Mitterrand, six of them, had deemed an, it until now neither possible, opportune, necessary, nor even correct or just to stabilize it as a truth of this type. Not one of them believed he was obliged to commit France, the French nation, the French Republic, in a kind of signature that would have come to assume responsibility for this truth, <coughs> France guilty of a crime against humanity. One could cite numerous such examples and such situations. Today I just quote my own country. We could cite numerous such examples from Japan to the United States or to Israel, which concern past violence or acts of repression, notorious war crimes, or more recently uncovered ones, the justified or unjustified use of atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for instance. As you know, despite the testimony of many historians, President Clinton persists in the official view that the decision to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki was justifiable. Not to mention what may still happen regarding the politics of Japan in Asia during the war, the Algerian War, the Gulf War, ex-Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Chechnya, and so forth. And since I've just mentioned Japan in parentheses, it so happens that when I was preparing this lecture, then Japanese Prime Minister Muruyama made a declaration whose every word and whole pragmatic structure would have to be evaluated. Without commenting the Japanese state at its head and in the permanence of its imperial identity, in the, in the person of the emperor, Muro Yamada, the prime minister, speaks, and before what he calls significantly, I quote, these irrefutable facts of history and an error in our history, an error in our history, Muro Yamada expresses it in his own name, in his own name, but the name that says more than his own name, but he, he, he speaks as a prime minister, but in no way commits the name of the emperor. He says, he expresses in his own name what he called his heartfelt apology and his mourning. This mourning is at once personal and vaguely, very confusedly, that of the nation and the state. What is a state mourning when it grieves for the death of those that are neither heads of state nor even fellow citizens? How is one to think a remorse or the excuses of a state now that international law has defined crimes against humanity. The language of fault and confession are allied so as to attenuate the effect with the, the heterogeneous language of error. Mugo Yama speaks of the, uh, an error, error in our history. Here then one can, probably for the first time in history, dissociate the concept of the state of the nation from what had always characterized it in a structural fashion, namely good conscience. Up to now, a state should have good conscience. There is no bad conscience for a state. There was no bad. Now there is a bad conscience for a state. Uh, however confused this event may be, and however impure its motivations, its motivation remains, however calculated and conjunctural the strategy, there is here a progress, I would say, in the history of humanity and its international law of its science and its conscience. Kant, again, Kant, perhaps would have seen in it one of those events that are, he would have said, a sign, a sign that, like the French Revolution, for example, and despite the failure and the, the, or the limitation, a sign that reminds or demonstrates or heralds 
the possibility of uh, a tendency and the possibility, the possibility of a progress in humanity. At least a tendency, a sign of a possibility of a progress. All of this <coughs> remains incomplete for Japan, France, or Germany, but it is better than nothing. And that's a sign. Whereas the Soviet Union, for instance, or the Yugoslavia, which no longer exist as a state, they are protected from any guilty conscience and any public recognition of past crimes. The United States has a whole future before it. And I close this parenthesis and return home. That for more than a half century, no head of the French state deemed it possible, opportune, necessary, correct, or just to constitute as truth an immense French guilt, to recognize it as truth, all of this leads one to think that the value of truth in this case, that is veracity, the value of a statement concerning real facts, because truth is not reality, but above all, a statement in conformity with what one thinks, might depend on a political interpretation concerning values which are moreover heterogeneous. I said possibility, opportunity, necessity, correctness, or justice. To these value, values, truth or veracity would therefore in principle be subordinate. This is an enormous problem, as you know, doubtless a classical one, but it is a problem for which we must try today to find some historical political and techno-mediatic specificity. Among former presidents, de Gaulle himself, to whom Chirac nevertheless says he owes his own political inspiration, de Gaulle never dreamed of declaring the culpability of the French state under <coughs> the occupation. Even though, or perhaps because, the culpability of the French state, uh, this was moreover the official name of France under Vichy, the rep Republic having been <coughs> abolished and renamed Etat Francais, French state. Uh, the culpability of the French state was, in de Gaulle's eyes, that of a non-legitimate, if not illegal, state. We can also take the case of Vincent Riol, that other pres president of the Republic, which did not seem deem it possible, necessary, opportune, correct, or just to recognize <coughs> what Chirac has just recognized and recognized for conjunctural reasons that are no doubt more <coughs> complex than the simple unconditional obedience to the sacred commandment of which Kant speaks. Now, of 80 French parliamentary representatives, Vincent Auriol in 1940 was one of the very few who refused to vote full powers to Pétain on July 10, 1940. He therefore knew, alas, that the interruption of the Republic and the transition to this Etat Francais, guilty of the status of and deportation of Jews, was a legal act engaging the responsibility of a government of France, a legitimate government of France. The discontinuity of the interruption was itself inscribed in the legal continuity of the Republic in the Etat Francais. So it is the French Republic that, by way of its legally elected representatives, resigned its own status. Such, at least, is the truth in its formal and juridical legality. But what is the truth in the thing itself here, if there is one? François Mitterrand, on several occasions, and until the end of his last term, also refused to recognize the official culpability of the Etat Francais. He explicitly alleged that the said Etat Francais had been installed through usurpation by interrupting the history of the French Republic, the only political or moral person which had to account for its actions and which at the time found itself either, either gagged or in illegal resistance. <coughs> the French Republic today had nothing, according to him, to confess, nothing to confess. He did not have to assume the memory and culpability of a period in which it had been put out of action. The French nation, as such, and in its continuity, had no obligation to accuse itself of crimes against humanity, 
committed unjustly in its name. And Mitterrand refused such a recognition even as he inaugurated the public and solemn commemorations of the Valdiv raid when thousands of Jews were deported or to, to death. And even when there were many who, over the course of many years, through letters and official petitions, which I'm, with which I'm very familiar for having signed them, urged him to do what happily President Chirac has just done. Here then is a first series of questions. By not, on this example, by not declaring officially what is now a state's historical truth, where former presidents from De Gaulle to Mitterrand, were they lying or dissimulating? Does one have the right to say that? Like if Chirac says the truth, then had the other lied. Could they in turn accuse Chirac of lying? Are any of them lying? Who lied and who told the truth? Can one speak here of a of lie? Is that a pertinent concept? And if it is pertinent, what would be what would be the criterion of the lie? What would be the history of this lie? And especially a still different question, what would be the history of the concept of the lie that would support such questions? If there were some lie here, and if it were pertinent to determine this or that to be a lie, then who would be its subject, and who the addressee, that is the victim, the one who would have been deceived by such a lie? How could we identify the author and the addressee, that is the victim of the lie? I will naturally come back to the formation and formulation of this first series of questions, but still, in a preliminary mode, I would like to un underscore two original features in this example. On the one hand, there is, in fact, a historical novelty in this situation, in this pragmatics of the opposition, veracity versus lie, if not in the, in the essence of the lie. At issue here is a veracity or a lie of state determinable as such on a stage of international law that did not exist in this article, did not exist before the Second World War. These hypotheses, and all the history of this example, are posed today with reference to juridical concepts, such as crime against humanity, which did not exist before the Second World War, and which are inventions and thus performatives unknown to humanity before this, as juridical concepts implying international jurisdictions, contracts, and interstate charters, institutions, and courts of justice that are in principle, in principle, universal. <coughs> if all of this is, is historical through and through, it is because the problematic of the lie, or of the confession, the imperative of veracity on the subject of something like a crime against humanity had no sense, either for individuals or for the state, had no sense before the definition of this juridical concept in Articles 6C of the statuses of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, and in particular as concerns France, unless I'm mistaken, had no sense before these crimes were declared imprescriptible by a law dated December 26, 1964. On the other hand, the objects in question, those on the subject of which a <coughs> verdict is to be reached, these objects are not natural realities in themselves. They depend on interpretations but also on performative interpretation. I'm not speaking here of the act of performative language by which confessing some culpability, a head of state produces an event and provokes a reinterpretation of all the languages of his predecessors. Rather, I mean to underscore above all the performativity at work in the very objects of these declarations, the legitimacy of a so-called 
sovereignty, sovereign state, the position of a boundary, the identification or attestation of a responsibility, they are performative acts. <coughs> when performative succeed, they produce a truth whose power sometimes impose itself, imposes itself forever. The location of a boundary, for instance, the installation of a state, are always acts of performative violence. That in, if the conditions of the international community permit it, create the law, whether durably or not, where there was none or no longer any law, no longer a strong enough law. In creating the law, this performative violence, which is neither legal nor illegal, because it creates the law, this performative violence creates what is then held to be legal truth, the dominant and juridically incontestable, incontestable public truth. Where today is the truth concerning boundaries in ex-Yugoslavia, for instance, in all its divided enclaves that are enclaved in, an, in other enclaves, or in Chechnya, or in Israel? <coughs> who tells the truth, and who lies in these areas? For the better and for the worse, this performative dimension makes the truth, as Augustine says, makes the truth. It therefore imprints its irreducibly historical dimension on both veracity and the lie. And this original performative dimension is not taken thematically into account, it seems to me, by either Kant or Anna Arendt. I will try to show that despite everything that divides or opposes them from another point of view, they share this misrecognition, or at least this insufficient explicitation, just as they both neglect <coughs> the symptomal or unconscious dimension of this phenomena. Such phenomena cannot be approached without, at the very least, the combination of a, let's say, logic of the unconscious and a theory of the performative. This does not mean that the current and presently elaborated discourse of psychoanalysis on the one hand, or of speech act theory on the other hand, is sufficient to the task. It means even less that there is already a, a ready articulation between them, or between them and a discourse on politics, or the economy of tele-technological knowledge and power. We are defining here a task and the conditions of an analysis on the scale of these phenomena of our time. Rewriting of history, lie, falsification, negation, and disavowal, all these questions point towards stakes that, because they are so easily recognizable, I did not even think it was useful to insist on them. For lack of time, I will do no more here than evoke or situate in the immediate vicinity of a new problematic of the truth of state, those searing figures that are revisionism <coughs> or and negationism. You know that these figures are endlessly proliferating. They are reborn from the very ashes they would like at the same time to conjure away and insult. How is one to fight them? Which is to say, first of all, refute them, dispute them, recall them to the very truth of their negationist and disavowed relentlessness. How to prove by bearing witness what is the best response at once the, the most just, the most correct, the most critical, and the most reliable? Will this perversion be resisted by establishing by law a truth of state? Or rather, on the contrary, <coughs> by reinitiating internal, interminably, if necessary, as I believe it will be, reinitiating the discussion, the recalling of evidence and witnesses, the work and discipline of memory, the indisputable demonstration of an archive, an infinite task, no doubt, which always must be begun again. But isn't it the distinctive feature of a task, whatever it may be? No state, no law of state, no reason of state, raison d'état, 
will ever be able to take its measure. This does not mean that the state has to renounce its right of it or, or its law, but one must keep a vigilant watch to make sure it does not do disservice to the cause of a truth that, when led to itself, it always risks perverting into dogmatism or orthodoxy. So as to illustrate just how formidable this performative power can be in our tele-techno-mediatic modernity, I could invoke, if I had time, another apparently minor sequence in the same story. I said the media would occupy a central place in this analysis. Uh, the sequence would have concerned, if I had time, the way in which the New York Times, the newspaper, the New York Times, through an article signed by an academic, a university professor, produced what I would call a counter-truth to account for the recent declaration of Chirac. The New York Times has lied uh, or legitimated a lie on the subject of the role that some French intellectuals, including myself, have played in this sequence. Uh, but <coughs> for lack of time, I won't, I won't uh, analyze this uh, through and through. What I would have liked to underscore <coughs> is that the counter-truth produced by this professor, the authority of this professor in a powerful mass media does not belong to the category either of either lie or ignorance or error doubtless not even to the category of self-deception that Anna Arendt talks about. That's why I call it a counter-truth. It is not reducible to any of the categories bequeathed to us by traditional thinking about the lie from Plato to and Augustine up to Kant and even up to Anna Arendt, despite all the differences that separate all these thinkers from each other. For here, the, here is the hypothesis that I wish to submit for your discussion. The concept of lie to oneself, or self-deception, for which Anna Arendt has an essential need to us to mark the specificity of the modern lie as absolute lie. This concept is also a concept that is irreducible to what is called in all classical rigor a lie. But what I'm calling here too quickly the classical rigor of the concept of life also has a history to which we are heirs and which in any case occupies a dominant place in our heritage and in our common language. Self-deception is not bad faith, either in the ordinary sense or in the sense Sartre <coughs> gives to it. It requires, therefore, another logic, other words. It requires that one take into account both some mediatic techno-performativity and the logic of the phantasma, which is to say of the spectral, or of a symptomatology of the unconscious, toward which the work of Anna Arendt signals, but which it never deploys, it seems to me, as such. There are several signs in truth and politics that this concept of lie to oneself plays a determining role in the Arendtian analysis of the modern life. To be sure, Arendt finds material to illustrate this lie to oneself in anecdotes or in or discourses from other centuries. We have known for a long time, she, she notes, that it is difficult to lie to others without lying to oneself to some extent. And I quote, the more successful a liar is, the more, li the more likely it is that he will fall prey to his own fabrications, unquote. But it is especially to modernity that she assigns this possibility from which she draws a very paradoxical consequence on the subject of democracy itself. As if this ideal regime were also the one in which deception were properly destined to become self-deception. Arendt acknowledges, therefore, what she calls an undeniable strength to the arguments of conservative critics of mass democracy. <coughs> I quote, 
conservative critics of mass democracy have frequently outlined the dangers that this form of government brings to international affairs without, however, mentioning the dangers peculiar to monarchies and oligarchies. The strength of their argument, the, the strength of the arguments of these uh, conservative critics of mass democracy, the strength of their arguments lies in the undeniable fact that under fully democratic conditions, deception without self-deception is well nigh impossible, unquote. Which means that in full democracy, deception must be self-deception, okay, if this concept is reliable. Ali suspended the capital, but far too difficult question of what can be understood here by fully democratic conditions. I do not know if she, Anna Arendt, read or knew it, but we have an obligation to the truth to say that these Arendtian theses fall directly in line with an article by Alexandre Coiré, also published in New York. Coiré's article appeared in 1943 during the war in the issue of Renaissance, uh, a journal of the École Libre des Hautes Études in New York, with the title Réflexion sur le mensonge, Reflection on, on the Lie, and was republished in June 1945 with the title, quote, I quote, The Political Function of the Modern Life, 1945. The Political Function of the Modern Life. And it begins as follows, I quote, Coiré, Never has there been so much lying as in our day. Never has lying been so shameless, so systematic, so unceasing. <coughs> and all the Arendian, Arendian themes are already there, in particular that of the lie to oneself, I quote, that uh, Coiré, that man has always lied to himself and to others is indisputable. And of the modern lie, Coiré says, I quote, right now we want to concern ourselves with the contemporary lie, and even more strictly with the contemporary political lie. We remain convinced that in this sphere, the present epoch, or more exactly, its totalitarian regimes, has created some mighty innovations. Modern man, genus totalitarian, modern man, bathes in the lie, breathes the lie, is enthralled to the lie every moment of his existence." Unquote. But Coiré also poses a question that unfortunately he does not pursue, at least not in the direction that would seem to me necessary today. He wonders in fact, which Aaron did not do, he wonders in fact whether one still has, I quote, the right to speak here of life. The right to speak here of life. Uh, uh, now, for, for, for lack of time, we, we cannot closely, closely uh, follow here the, uh, the answer he had like, to this question. Uh, uh, um, I have to skip a, a development on, on Coiré and jump to, uh, to uh, conclusion. I must ask him this prolegomena toward their conclusion and return to Anna Arendt. Is a history of the lie possible as such? I am less certain of it than ever. But supposing that one were still to attempt such a history, then one would have to take into account the whole oeuvre of Anna Arendt, and more precisely in the two essays I've cited, a double square of motives, one of which uh, set, uh, of which one set seems propitious, and the other set unfavorable for such a project. So in conclusion then, a program and two, two squares of four telegrams. In the first place, several motives seem propitious for such a history of the life. First, <coughs> the concern clearly expressed to remove such a history from what she calls moral denunciation. That is somewhat like Nietzsche in a fashion that is both analogous and different, Arendt wanted to treat this question in what Nietzsche called an extra-moral sense. 
in this text <laughs> online. You know, Nietzsche's text online in an extra moral sense. Second, so exclusion of ethics. Second, or of morality. Second, the consideration not only of the <coughs> development of the media, but also of a new mediatic structure that has transformed the status of the iconic substitute of the image and of public space, consequently. That a thematic which is absent from Coiré's remark. Third, the clearly marked intention on the part of Anna Arendt to delimit the order of the political, to surround the order of the political with theoretical, practical, social, and institutional boundaries which are in principle very strict, even if, uh, as one can easily imagine, they remain difficult to draw for non-contingent reasons. This is undertaken by Arendt in two directions. On the one hand, by setting out that man, man in his singularity, in what she calls the philosophical truth of his solitude, of his solitary individuality. Man is, I quote, unpolitical by nature. That's uh, uh, something <coughs> new in the history of, of political philosophy of the West. Man, in his singularity, is unpolitical by nature. On the other hand, so that's a delimitation of the political. On the other hand, by assigning to the order of the, the judiciary, <coughs> on the one hand, and the university, on the other hand, by assigning new missions, <coughs> to the judiciary at the university. I insist on this here. <coughs> By assigning to the order of the judiciary and the university, which is virtually, virtually, in principle, independent of the political, new missions. By assigning to the university new missions and capital responsibilities in this delimitation of the political life. Fourth and finally, although the word is not used and there is not a, a sufficient or determining development, a problematic is sketched of the performativity of the lie whose structure and event would be linked in an essential fashion to the concept of action and more precisely political action. And that's a, a very strange and, uh, and uh, uh, disquieting aspect of her uh, text. Anna Arendt often recalls that the liar, the liar, is a man of action. <laughs> and I would even add par excellence. That is between, she says, between lying and acting, acting in politics. That is manifesting one's own freedom through action, transforming facts, anticipating the future. There is something like an essential affinity. The imagination is, according to her, the common root of the, what she called the ability to lie and the capacity to act. <laughs> capacity to produce some image. Productive imagination as experience of time, Kant and Hegel would have said. So the lie is the future, so to speak. One may venture to say beyond the letter of our text, but without betraying Arendt's intention in this context. The lie, to lie is to have a view to the future. To tell the truth, on the contrary, is to say what is or what will have been. And it would be uh, to prefer instead the past. Hmm? To prefer the truth is to prefer the past. And to lie is to prefer the future. <laughs> even, even if she insists on marking its limits, Aaron speaks of, and I have to quote her because I wouldn't agree easily in this, she speaks of the, I quote, undeniable affinity of the lie with action, with changing the world, in short, with politics. The liar, says Arendt, needs no accommodation to appear, I quote, on the political scene. He has the great advantage that he always is, so to speak, already in the midst of it. He is an actor by nature. He says what is not so because he wants, he wants things to be different from what they are. That is, he wants to change the world. In other words, our ability to lie, she goes on, but not necessarily to tell the truth, belongs among the, the few obvious demonstrable data that confirm human freedom. 
So the, the proof of human freedom is on the side of the liar, not on, on the side of the one who <laughs> tells the truth. Even, even if such uh, utterances require some modelization and need to be placed more prudently under a certain index of possibility, a translation that I, we, don't have, that we don't have the time to undertake now, it goes without saying that not only do we, do we have here, as <coughs> eliminated by Arendt, the very idea of a history of the lie, but more radically, the thesis according to which there would be no history in general, and no political history in particular, without at least the possibility of lying, that is of, according to God, freedom and action, and also of imagination and of time, of imagination as time. Now, in what way does the Arendtian discourse close or risk closing when it opens up in this manner? This is what I would like to evoke in conclusion, or at least so has to have done with this modest prolegomena. For on the other hand, four motives seem to me to have played an inhibiting role, if not a prohibiting role, in the attempt to take such a history of the lie seriously. First, the, veritable abs the absence of a veritable problematic of testimony in Arendt, of witnessing, of bearing witness. Arendt is not interested in the history of this concept as that which strictly distinguishes it strictly dis distinguishes the, the concept of bearing witness testimony from the proof or the archive. I think there is a, an absolute heterogeneity between proof, proving, and bearing witness. Even in fact, and not by chance, an equivocation always blurs the limits between these radically heterogeneous possibilities. The distinction between what she called factual truth and rational truth, which forms the backbone of this whole discourse, appears to be insufficient here. Arendt herself acknowledges that she is using it provisionally and for convenience. <coughs> she names testimony more than once, but no more than she does with the lie, with faith or good faith. She does not make it the veritable, veritable <coughs> theme of an essential eidetic analysis nor does Corvey for this matter. Both of them proceeds, proceed as if they knew, as if they knew what lying means, meant. Second, and this is not unrelated to the concept of lying to oneself or internal self-deception, which plays a determining role in all these demonstrations by Anne Arendt. Now, such a concept, lying to oneself, self-deception, such a concept remains confused in the psychology it implies. It is also logically incompatible with the rigor of any classical concept of the lie. To lie will always mean to deceive the other intentionally and consciously, and while knowing what it is that one is deliberately hiding. Therefore, why not lying to oneself? One cannot lie to oneself in the strict sense. The self, if at least this word has a sense, the self excludes the self-lie. Any other experience, therefore, calls for another name. And no doubt arises, uh, of course I'm going quickly here, and no doubt arises from another zone or another structure from intense subjectivity, or the relation to the other, to the other in oneself, in an ipsedi, in a, in a selfhood, if you want, more originary than the ego, whether individual or, or collective. And I would say an enclaved ipsedi, a divisible or split <coughs> ipsedi, split selfhood. I will not say that psychoanalysis, or in the Heideggerian sense, the analytic of Dasein, that is, two discourses, Freud's and Heidegger's, that are no longer ordered principally, principally around the theory of the ego or the self. I don't say that these discourses are alone capable of taking the measure of the phenomena 
that Arendt calls lying to oneself or self-deception. And moreover, neither Kant nor Heidegger, neither Freud nor Heidegger <coughs> took seriously or theoretically the problem of the techne, technolo, technomedia that I'm referring to here. Um, nevertheless, Arendt, like Corey, at the point at which both of them speak necessarily of lying to oneself in politics, apparently do everything to avoid <coughs> the least allusion to Freud and to Heidegger on this problem. Is this fortuitous? Is it fortuitous that they do not even mention the Marxist concept of ideology, if only to re-elaborate it? Because despite uh, the fundamental obscurity of the, this Marxist concept of ideology, despite the philosophical or theoretical limits of the discourse that have sometimes deployed it, I would, I, would, I, would, I would think, the concept of ideology, all the same, marks a place, a site, of that which we are seeking to determine here. Even if this determination remains a sort of negative topology, it is, uh, I mean, even if this delimitation by the concept of ideology remains a sort of negative topology, it is very valuable and takes us farther beyond consciousness and knowledge <coughs> in the direction of a locus of non-truth that is neither that of error, ignorance, or illusion, nor that of the lie or lying to oneself. Ideology is not an error, it's not ignorance, it's not a lie, it's not an illusion. It's more complex than that. So the place of this problematic should have been, ta been taken seriously by uh, Arendt uh, or Corey. Ideology in the Marxist sense has nothing to do with any of these uh, things. <coughs> Error, ignorance, illusion, and, 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 and lie. What seem, third, what seems to compromise, if not the project of such a history of the lie, at least its irreducible specificity, is finally an indestructible optimism on the part of Anna Arendt. Such an optimism <coughs> is not to be accounted for by psychology, by the psychology of Anna Arendt. It does not reflect primarily a personal disposition, <coughs> a habitus, a being in the world, or even a project of Anna Arendt herself. After all, to speak of our age as the age of the absolute lie, to seek to acquire the means to analyze it with relentless lucidity hardly shows optimism, of course. But optimistic, rather, is the conceptual <coughs> and problematic apparatus that is here put in place or accredited. What is at stake is the determination of the political lie, but also, above all, of the truth in general. <coughs> the latter, the truth, according to Arendt, the truth must always win out and end up being revealed, she says, because, and she repeats this frequently, because in its structure, truth is assured stability, irreversibility. It indefinitely outlives lies, fictions, and images. And this classical determination of the truth as indefinite survival of the stable, be beyond in Plato's and Aristotle terms. Indefinite survival of what is precisely stable, firm, mm, irreversible. This classical determination of the truth seems not only to call for a great number of questions, let's say deconstructive questions, and not only in the Heideggerian style, by even excluding the possibility that a lie might survive indefinitely it not only goes against experience itself, we know that life may survive indefinitely. It makes of history, as history of the lie, the epidermic and epiphenomenal accident of a presentation of truth, a parousia of truth. Finally, the truth always wins and presents itself. Finally, it must present itself. <coughs> now, a specific history of the lie itself should pass at least at least by way of the history of Christianization with Paul, with certain <coughs> church fathers, with Augustine and his demandatio and so forth, of the Greek thematics of pseudos, 
at the same time, as I said earlier at the beginning, the false, the fictive, and the deceptive, which does not simplify things or simplifies them too much. Of the idolon, the image, and of the spectral phantasma, or rhetoric, or sophistics, uh, adjusted to what we know uh, 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 as the structure of the media today, the virtuality of the media, and so on. And of school also, you should go through sophi the history of rhetoric, of sophistics, the, what Plato called the politically useful lie in Plato's Republic. The useful curative or preventive lie as pharmacon. <coughs> and this radical Christianization is found in the secularized state, so to speak, and in the age of enlightenment, in the Kantian doctrine that condemns the lie as absolute decline. Humans, human nature's capital vice, Kant says, negation of human dignity. The man who does not believe what he says is less than a thing, says Kant in his doctrine of virtue. One will be tempted to reply, unless he does not see thereby, that, that what Arendt would reply, and he, he wants to show his freedom by lying, unless he does not see thereby being less than a thing in order to become something, and even someone already something like a man. And four, that is why finally one may always worry about the secondarization, relativization, or accidentalization, even the banalization of a theory or history of the life, once it's still dominated by the oriented certainty of a final victory <coughs> of the truth, a certain survival of the truth, and not merely of veracity over the life. Even if one accepts its teleology as only a just regulating idea in politics on the, on the, or in the history of the human socius, sociality in general. It is not a matter here for me of opposing to this risk the Judeo-Christiano-Kantian hypothesis of the lie as radical evil and sign the originary corruption of human existence. But to mark that, that will be my conclusion, to mark that without at least, at least the possibility, the structural possibility of this radical perversion and of its infinite survival, possibly infinite survival. And notably, if one does not take into account technical mutations, and I would take this problem of techniques very seriously here, technical mutations in the history and in the structure of the simulacrum and of the iconic substitute. Television is only one example. One will always fail to think the lie in itself. One will always fail to think the possibility of its history, the possibility of a history that intrinsically involves it, and doubtless the possibility of a history to altogether. Hmm? If we don't uh, <coughs> combine a certain logic of the unconscious, a new theory of performativity articulated with a theory of techne of the, and the media and the spectrality of the media, it would be impossible to think the new era <coughs> of the political line. But to speed up the conclusion, one has to admit that nothing and no one will ever be able to prove, precisely to prove, what is properly called proof in the strict sense of knowledge, of uh, determinant judgment, of theoretical demonstration, to prove the existence and the necessity of such a history as history of the line. One can only say what it could be or what it should be this history of the life, if there is one. Thank you. to lie is to be conscious of the truth but of the, I didn't say that lying implies that you are conscious of the truth 
but simply of the truth of what you think is true. It's not the same. Hmm? A liar, in the classical sense, a liar must be aware of not the truth in itself, not the truth of the things, but of the truth of what he thinks. Okay? It's different. I know, in order to lie, I should know what I, what I think and what I want to say and what I want to hide, to hide or to, to distort. So I have to have the knowledge of what I think and what I want to say. That's what, uh, at the beginning I, I distinguished the, the lie from, uh, uh, from the false, from, from the wrong. You, you, may, you may say something wrong, something false, without lying. I may, in good faith, say something wrong. It's not a lie. The point was the intention to deceive. Yes. And therefore, what we counterpose Um, the, the intention to deceive is the intention to speak honestly, which perhaps has very little to do with the truth. Yeah. Because, as you say, but it seemed to me that towards the end of the lecture, you um, uh, fastened on, of course, you were talking in terms of Hannah Arendt's um, article, that the truth will triumph. That's hardly the point. That's what she says. That's what she uh, says. No, no, no I, I, I was just quoting her. She said that finally, finally, the truth will prevail. Even if it's, uh, it takes a long time, what is true will prevail over the, the lies and the mystification and so on and so forth. So the whole context, in fact, of the debate gets internalized to the speaker. Uh, the whole business of lying is really related to the character of the self rather than to any objective truth out there. You also talked about the archives and memory, but as though all of these are objectives out there. No, 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 no. I insist on the fact that, that, that uh, an archive is in, uh, always a, a selection and in, interpretation. Now, I was not, I was not defending the, uh, the classical concept of the lie. I wanted to analyze what we what is uh, given to us as the concept, the rigorous concept of the lie, in its classical implications. I didn't, and I said that it's not enough in order to analyze today the distortions of what Anna Arendt calls lies. What happens today uh, in the media sometimes is a lie in the classical sense. There are people who, individuals who in, intentionally uh, distort what they know as uh, is true, no doubt. But it's not enough to produce what, for instance, the, the, the information, the political information, the media produce today uh, uh, in the form of truth. There are sometimes uh, informations which don't tell the truth without uh, us to be able to determine in the, in the huge technical system or political system an individual in conscious intention to lie. Mm -hmm. So we have a production of non-truth uh, uh, with, without any conscious or self-conscious intention of lying. Uh, you cannot account for what is produced today uh, in the media, for, us, for instance, uh, with uh, deliberate intention. I d would not deny that there is such, such deliberate intention somewhere, okay? But it's not enough to, uh, to account for uh, the, the, the most formidable uh, uh, transformations of truth, production of uh, interpretations which are neither true nor false and so on and so forth. We have today, uh, because of the change it's not absolutely. It's not absolutely new. It's not purely new, but it's massively different. But we say there are there are roots, old roots in that. But what happens quantitatively today with the technology of communication is transforming qualitatively the situation. And and it's not. Uh, we can't account for this uh, by self-deception or that is a uh, self conscious deception or self-deception or uh, self-conscious intentions 
uh, of, of lying. Mm. So we have to, uh, that was only a, a tentative program, so to speak. We have to, to rely on new types of discourse and to use the resources of psychoanalysis. I'm not referring to a, a certain orthodoxy of psychoanalysis, to a certain type of uh, uh, psychoanalysis, to uh, uh, speech act theory, to the, the question of performative, and the analysis of technology, the techno of the media, which has its specificity, and which is a constantly, uh, uh, it, which is a, a very rapid process. It's a, an extraordinary uh, mutation. So we have to take all these things into account to account for what's happening in politics today in terms of truth and lie. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. um, I have a very small question which um, to speak get up oh. so that you can um, I have a very small question and um, I was really fascinated by the uh, relationship that uh, she drew between uh, acting and lying, that action and uh, the intention to lie really was an, uh, an act of production and uh, changing the world. Again, I was following Arendt. Uh, 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 in the way that she draws attention to it. And her, and her other uh, contention that finally uh, the ability of truth to prevail and declare itself, so to speak. Um, I was wondering whether, you know, two things, uh, and I was wondering what you would uh, you would say to that, which is, um, is, is the sort of creative power of truth really that of uh, survival? And secondly, um, the world as we know it, I mean, in order to have the world and create the world as we know it, is, it abs is, is the necessity to continuous, I mean, would you say that there is a necessity to oscillate between lying and truth, and therefore action and the ability to change the world and truth that Prevails and survives. Mm. You know, uh, what was difficult for me in this lecture, and that's why initially, without playing, uh, I said I wouldn't tell the whole, the whole truth, uh, everything I said. I said because in, in finally, uh, I would not, I would not rely on a mere opposition between uh, truth and, and lie. Mm? Um, uh, when Anna Arendt says, well, the truth will finally prevail, she refers to the stability of the truth as if the truth were something real. And any philosopher knows that truth is not reality. And you should dissociate between reality and truth is the quality of a relation to reality, the quality of a, of a statement, the quality of an intuition, the quality of a knowledge, but the reality is not true or false. So, so when you, when you uh, uh, attribute the firmness, the solidity, the stability to the truth, you mistake the, the truth for reality or the reality for the truth. As for myself, without uh, wanting to destroy the, the value of truth, I know that truth is part of a, of a judgment, of an interpretation, uh, it's a relation to reality. So a truth cannot be a, uh, as stable, as objective, objectal, as a reality. Okay? But a lie is also that relation. That's why, that's why uh, yeah. of course, that's why it is a difficult problem. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have several names, uh, I'm going to call on people. Uh, uh, just one or two more sentences. If I insisted a lot on performative, it's not, it doesn't mean that I rely on, on the th any theory of speech act, any, and even the distinction between constitutive and performative. But provisionally, I insist on the performative because a performative in itself is neither true nor false. When you create a state, when you uh, uh, say, well, this will be a republic, hmm? India will be a republic, okay? Uh, it's neither true nor false, okay? Uh, even if in the Declaration of Independence of, uh, of the United States, they say, well, uh, they refer to God and to nature. We know that they invented something new, that's a new event, and the e event in itself is an interpretation, an active interpretation, Nietzsche would say, an active interpretation, which is neither uh, 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 true nor false. They didn't lie, when, but they didn't tell the truth. 
the, 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 the founding fathers of any republic, uh, the United States, let's take, let's take the example of the United States again. <laughs> the founding fathers didn't tell the truth, but didn't, didn't lie either. When they say the good people of America and so on, we have must emancipate, that, that was a performative. Hmm? A constitution is a performative. And a, a performative is an active interpretation which produces something which then passes uh, for truth. That was the, the case of the example I, take, I took with, with Chirac and all this, uh, this uh, story. Uh, which doesn't mean that then uh, the, there is no truth value and there is no lie anymore. No, no, I take the, the opposition very seriously. But I know that this opposition depends on something stronger, on a stronger theory. And that's, that's the stronger theory I would like to contribute to, to elaborate. Yes, yes. Louder. Louder. I, I'm a little, a little deaf. In the, yeah. uh, I was wondering if you would consider the confessional and the torture chamber as spaces for producing lies. Uh, during your discussion, I was reminded uh, of a very interesting moment in Roman Polanski's film, Death and the Maiden, which uh, the victim of a former torturer, uh, the former regime after that regime has been overthrown, uh, she meets this former torturer and actually imprisons the, him at home and attempts to videotape a confession. Of course, inevitably, that confession of guilt is not elicited at that particular moment. Is not? It's not elicited at that moment. The attempt fails. So I was wondering where you would place these two spaces, the torture chamber and the confession, in terms of your own as spaces for producing violence. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure uh, I understood the question. But let, let me try to say something. Uh, a confession, as such, is a performative. Hmm? Uh, when you, when you uh, confess, you don't simply inform the other of uh, some event. You, you may, for instance, say, well, uh, I have killed this man. It's not a confession if you report. A report is not a confession. In a confession, you say, well, not only did I kill the man, but I'm guilty for that. And, and I confess it. And this this uh, confession of a guilt produces performatively a truth. That's what St. Augustine said. When, uh, why do I confess uh, to God who is supposed to know everything? Hmm? I confess, I won't, I won't teach him anything. Okay? I confess in order to uh, improve myself, to uh, uh, acknowledge that I'm guilty, and then to transform myself and so to transform myself and, and the others. Mm? So a confession is a, a performative which tries to transform uh, the one who confesses and, and, and the others. A, a videotape or, or let's say an archive is not of that type. Uh, uh, it's not a, an a, a videotape doesn't produce any truth as such. Mm? Uh, uh, it is supposed to to uh, uh, to uh, regist registrate something, but it's not. It doesn't produce any truth, and that's the problem of testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I think that Anna Arendt and Corey and perhaps Kant also misses the specificity of the testimony. A testimony, in in its classical sense, again, in, is different from a proof. It implies that one swears. Tell the truth. Uh, when I bear witness, I say, well, believe me, trust me, I saw this, I did this, and I hear, heard this, and no one can, no one except myself can uh, um, see, uh, uh, may I have seen this, okay? Uh, there is no, believe me, there where there is no proof. Mm? That's why uh, we, we rely on uh, witnesses, on testimonies, when there is no Proof, and it's only a matter of, of trust, of belief, of of uh, uh, relying on someone, someone else. Yeah? And uh, uh, lie, the lie in its classical sense, is depends on uh, 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 on witnessing. It's it's a matter of bearing witness. A liar is someone who uh, it's a perjurer. It's someone who claims is or she is bearing witness. 
without telling the truth. That's, that's why uh, lying is a perjury. Hmm? It's false witness, which is, not, which is not wrong witness. You may be witness, uh, you may report something which is wrong. I have seen someone doing something, and I'm, I, have, I didn't see the real thing. But if I report sincerely, if I bear witness sincerely, uh, it's not a false witness. It, it's a wrong witness uh, with testimony, but it's not false witnessing. So we have to distinguish between the videotape, which doesn't bear witness. For That's why in the recent trial, in many trials, with the let let's take an example I, I'm familiar with because I've been <coughs> teaching on it a lot. The you've heard about the the Rodney King verdict in California. There, there was a young a young man who had a, a video camera and who accidentally incidentally could. <coughs> Uh, uh, record what happened. So he gave the film, and you know what, what happened in the States when everyone could see on the, on the TV the, the policeman beating this poor man, something which occurs every day, m a million times a day, but this time the nation as such could see the archive on, on the screen. Okay? But during the trial, this archive was not taken as a testimony and uh, 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 was not considered a tes testimony. And uh, the young man who had uh, videotaped had to come to the, court, to the bar, to the court, and swear and say, well, I swear I'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and uh, only the truth, because that's considered the uh, given word. That's, that's another order of, of good faith, of faith. And we have to distinguish. When we speak of lie, we speak of faith and good faith. We don't speak of objective truth of archive and, and of proof. I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I've answered your question, but uh, I've uh, spoken a lot. Yeah. I'm going to uh, take advantage of my presence here. And just at this moment, uh, because it's a related question, ask you that when you look at this whole thing on self-deception, uh, could I take you from that to bearing witness? and ask you that, um, is it not true that in, in some ways in the entire psychoanalytical enterprise has to deal with the issue of uh, I bearing false witness to myself? So how would you distinguish mm -hmm. between self-deception and uh, bearing it, false witness to myself? Uh, I think uh, <coughs> the whole space of psychoanalysis has to do with bearing witness. The whole field is a field of witness, not of proof, not of reality, but of truth and bearing witness. But I think no psychoanalysis as such would rigorously speak of false witnessing. Of course, I, I transform because of phantasms, because of a number of, of libidinal interests and so on and so forth. I transform something, either my, my real experience of some phantasmatic experience, there is a transformation, a, a process of transformation. But this process of transformation cannot be summarized or, or reduced to a, a false witnessing. I don't mean by that that there is no false witnessing, but finally, in the last instance, uh, it's not a matter of, of lying to oneself and and of, of um, false witness. It's something else. It's, you see, my, my problem here is not to give up the classical value of lying, veracity, um, false witness, and so on, but to <coughs> locate them, to circumscribe them in a, in a space which is larger than them and which is more complex and which requires a, a more powerful theory without nevertheless destroying something we need under the name of uh, veracity and, and, um, and authentic uh, uh, testimony and so on and so forth. And when I say this, it's not only a matter of, let's say, philosophical, uh, uh, philosophical scruple, philosophical uh, uh, rigor. It's a matter of politics and ethics and politics. We have two things to do at the same time, and they are sometimes difficult to, to, uh, to associate. On the one hand, we have to keep 
the classical value, to say, well, there are lies. We have, we have to, uh, there, are poli- there are political lies. There are people who intentionally distort the truth. And we have to, uh, to take this seriously. Hmm? But on the other hand, if we want to analyze, uh, to take the real measure of what's going on today, we know that things are going on in terms of, of distorting or producing um, interpretations which are more powerful than self-conscious uh, intentions. There are machinery, there are systems. Uh, who knows, for instance, when, let, let, let me take an example again. When during the, the war, during Gulf, the Gulf War, for instance, which is a, now a canonic example hmm, of what the, the media did of course, there has been orders. There was an, the authority of a government, of an army, and so. But there was also <laughs> such a powerful machinery that it is difficult to assign the place of an intention. No, well, this man, this general, was guilty. Difficult. So when we have to do with apparatuses, with systems, with powerful uh, techno systems, which are not simply state systems. Now we have. Corporations of media, which are international, hmm? uh, 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 financial powers, technical powers, which are not individual, not even, uh, uh, which not even depend on small groups and not even depend on the authority of a state, but are stronger than a state. Will it be pertinent to locate the intention, the, the conscious intention of someone who would like to distort the truth? No. no. If we want to, to know what's happening today with, with the network of the, of the corporations, the media corporations, the people who not only build the computers, but produce this, the systems, uh, data banks, and the systems of translation, and so on and so forth, uh, why, why would we find the, the, the conscience here? Uh, you will hear. I'm sorry, I have a number of names. And we have to make our questions short. And I have to answer shortly yeah. too. Ends of humanity. And we the end of our own thought that now part and all many tricks have been played to achieve great larger end of life, great larger benefit. So uh, my first question is, where do you place such lies in the scheme of relationship of lying and truth? Number two, sir. What place do you, uh, you uh, give to hope? The hope is something which always sees the in the, tries to get the intangible and sees the invisible and almost tries to achieve the impossible. It's a, it can be called a deliberate a, a cheating with oneself as well as cheating. And if you are, as, uh, you can, I, I just can visualize in what you call the example of the Gorbachev. There he sold hope to Russia. I think he must have been a very, very honest man. Yet, made partly fearing, partly being in his mind that all that might not be achievable. <coughs> As we say that mankind does not, cannot be true of reality. Many of us, millions of us, I've talked to thousands of people on this call, they just need fake satisfaction in life. They need half substantial <coughs> satisfactions. And somebody may honestly <coughs> sell those dreams to humanity to mankind, and with the purest intention of serving. So where do you place such lies? And last, for example, from literature. For? From literature's literature. Where would you place Desdemona's lie? Like, who did it? That's what my Isn't that nobler than many truth and the untruth? Uh, I, I, no, I have no answer to this question. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that's, that's the question I, sh- I share with you. At the beginning, I said first, literature, to, to start with the last question. Uh, literature is not a lie. Uh, it produces simulacra which are neither true nor false. Okay? Uh, you can't say that a fiction in literature is a lie. Okay? There are lies represented in, lit- in, in plays or in, in fictions, but the fiction itself is not a lie, and it's not uh, a reality or a truth either. Hmm? No. Uh, then, um, so I'm interested by the, this possibility of created simulacra or created new meanings or new signification, new situations, which are neither li- uh, uh, an act which is neither a lie 
nor a uh, veracity, it's something else. Mm. And that's, you can generalize this to everything. Mm. I don't mean that everything is literature, but this literary structure can be found elsewhere than, than literature. Mm. Now the question of hope uh, amounts to the same, so to speak. Uh, hope is neither a lie nor, nor a veracity. Mm. And it's, it's in the name of hope that you try to transform the situation and to produce interpretation, to produce, to, to produce new events. And when you produce an event, it's not a lie nor, uh, nor a veracity. Now, now uh, uh, in, the name, in the name of hope, I know that sometimes some people may lie, okay? May, 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 may lie in the classical sense. I'll tell you this, I know it's not true, I'll tell you this because I hope this will create a, a, a better situation. Uh, 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 there are what one calls white lies. When someone is dying and I won't tell him or her the truth because I think it's good, it's better not to, not to, not to tell the truth. Uh, in that, uh, to that question, I have no ready answer. Uh, if I confess that I have no ready answer, it means that I think that in some situations it may happen that lying is better than telling the truth. In some situations. But I won't generalize this. It, and I want to keep the right to examine and to analyze every situation. So from that point of view, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like Kant did, that you have to tell the truth unconditionally. Because I think this is... Uh, this is a, a consistent uh, statement on the part of, 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 of Kant. Hmm? But this is a consistent statement according to the axioms of a Christian uh, uh, society. Hmm? Uh, as I said a moment ago, Kant was not saying something, <coughs> something extraordinary. He was saying, well, if you analyze the language, you have to take into account that when you address another, you implicitly promise the other to tell the truth. Okay. Uh, uh, when when I when I speak to you, I I it, it, I in, it it's an intrinsic part of my speech act that I tell you the truth, even if I lie. Uh, in order for me to lie, you must imply that I tell you the truth. That's what lie consists in. When you lie, you tell the other I tell you the truth. Otherwise, it's not a lie. You won't you won't lie by saying the other I'm lying. The, the liar is someone who tells you. I tell you the truth, okay? So Kant, what is Kant doing? He says, well, since every address, every discourse addressing the other implies a truth-telling, then if you don't imply this truth-telling, you don't speak to the other. You may do whatever you want, you may, uh, it's not, you're not addressing the other, and you're not addressing anyone, else. you're not speaking, you're not speaking. So. The consequence of this analysis of what speaking means is that you should unconditionally uh, obey the commandment of telling the truth. So I'm not following this because I, I would say that sometimes in certain situations, some interpretations, some transformations have to occur. Be because not because I'm I'm I'm, I'm perverse or, or, or uh, but because I know that a, a, a performative which are part of the language. That's why I say Kant and Anna and don't don't take seriously the, this performativity. Since performativity is part of the language, uh, and since a performative is not sincere nor a lie, I want to keep the right of performatively changing the situation. And even the promise, even the promise to tell the truth is not true. A promise is a performative. So, so for me, in order to promise to tell the truth, I must do something, the promise, which is neither a lie nor a truth. Hmm? That's the promise of hope. When you, the hope is neither true nor, 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 nor false. And the promise, which is implicit in every language, the promise is not a truth telling or, uh, 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 or a lie. Uh, yes. Professor, could it be that there is a root line implicit in what might be called the egocentric 
view of self, which is the mother of all lies. Let me explain. There is a root lie in the idea that I'm only this person. And therefore, in my idea that you're only with this person. And therefore, in all the false identities with which our world is strewn. Now, this would be regarded in some streams of classical Indian philosophy as the root lie which is so powerful, the establishment of which is so powerful, that all these other lies that you mentioned are, are only inevitable. And yet, there would be a footnote qualification made, not by me, but by the sages, who are the true representatives of this tradition. They would say that playfully, not unplayfully, playfully, I could say that I am this person. But when this is unplayfully denied, that is when something which is innocence, which has the, if you like, the falsity of innocence, the playful denial of truth, that that becomes frozen into the hard, unplayful thing which we call a lie. But the root of that is not any particular grand historical public lie, but that something which is transmitted from consciousness to consciousness. The, the lie of the Hatmavada, as the saints are true. The lie that I am only this body. And let me just, just quote a great sage on this subject, Ramana Maharshi. He said to somebody, why do you say I am a man? Say I am. And if you are in some doubt, you can add I am a man. <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, if I may uh, 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 agree on something I'm, I'm not mastering, uh, 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 I would agree. The only thing I wanted to, to underline is the fact that the theory, the classical theory of the lie implies a theory of the ego, hmm? of the I. Hmm? A liar, to, to charge someone with lying, you must imply that the, this one is one with himself, with herself. That is an ego identical with himself. He knows the, the truth and he tells something else. Okay? So uh, we imply the theory, the classical theory of the truth, of the lie or the truth, implies the self-identity of what they call the subject, or the, the conscious, the intention. Uh, so perhaps the first lie, Nietzsche would say, would be the ego sum, the ego. Uh, I am who I am. Hmm? Uh, I am uh, myself. I am one with my, myself. And my intention is identical with my intention, and so on and so forth. That's something what, which psychoanalysis, among other things, uh, disturbs, disturbs. And perhaps the I is the first line. Say, uh, I am myself. But, uh, who would claim this uh, innocently and, 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 and uh, firmly? That's why the, the theory of the lie is so depends on so many uh, metaphysical assumptions. That, uh, uh, perhaps a footnote just to that. The overvaluation of speaking, which goes hand in hand in lie, may have something to do with this. Because yeah. speaking is predicative. And so it has the kind of life... Not simply be, predicative. It's well, also performative. No, no, all right. Yeah. Performative is not possible without, without predicative speech. Is it? Of course. Mm -hmm. There is no... You can't lie. That's something... Uh, uh, that's a, uh, an assumption that we could uh, agree on, I think. There is no lie without a speech act. Can you lie without speaking? No, Sometimes you can, may, may lie <laughs> silently, but this silence should imply some speech. You wouldn't say that, th theoretically, that a non-speaking being can lie, classically. No, but overvaluation of speaking may be a lie. Yeah? <laughs> but with, within speaking, within speech. I think there are uh, several hands that, uh, uh, it's quite clear that you could go on all night there might be either an overvaluation or a proper valuation of speech. I'm not in a uh, position to say, but I think the um, uh, procedure has. Uh, I, I do apologize to everybody who I uh, cannot call because I already have there's something like 20 persons who do uh, want to speak and engage, and I think there will be more opportunities. At least one more opportunity in JNU. Uh, tomorrow for uh, a discussion. Uh, yeah, yeah, on Monday. Uh, sorry, I was going to take away your Saturday and Sunday also. Um, with Professor Devida. Um, I would not dare to either summarize the lecture or the uh, very rich discussion which uh, started. Uh, I do briefly want to say that 
in some ways, you can see in the way in which Professor Derrida's thought has evolved uh, on this entire question of intentionality and uh, performative, that something very interesting happens when this is taken uh, to the site of politics. And we've uh, seen a very great enriching, not only of uh, uh, theories of performatives, uh, the relationship between Ispa and Vishesh and further narrative which would order these very complicated narratives together. There have been uh, questions about fallibility and sovereignty uh, which shift from uh, the domain of the church to the domain of the state in very interesting ways. Uh, there have been very interesting formulations on the problematic of origins, again, this time in relation to, to sociality and uh, the truth. Uh, clearly, what you have is a vast enriching, really, of the kind of domain within which one would uh, place these different kinds of uh, uh, terms. And uh, on behalf of everybody uh, who, uh, uh, who is gathered over here, as well as everyone who is standing in the corridors and uh, listening to this disembodied voice at this moment, uh, on behalf of everybody, I think uh, I'm sure everyone will want to join me in saying that we've had a very enriching experience, Professor Derrida, but obviously I think that some deferral is uh, necessary over here, and it does mean that we very much hope that we will come back and we will have an opportunity to uh, carry uh, many of these questions uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you. So that, thank you again. That's a common hope. Referring to, the, and I, I would like to mention simply that the the, the lecture on next Monday, uh, the the, has, the title has changed. We changed the subject. So, in order not to repeat this, so it will have to do with uh, the mother tongue and my Algerian uh, childhood, but the, the political problem of the mother tongue in Algeria. That will be the subject on for the Monday lecture. Thank you. <laughs>